Present. Councilmember at Large Austin. Present. Councilmember King. Present. Fashusta. Present. Fisher. Present. Baskin. Helly. Present. Waller. Present. We have a quorum, Your Honor. Thank you. Item one is a motion for adoption of the agenda. We need a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. And item number two is a motion approving the minutes from November 4, 2019. Need a motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. On the recognitions and awards, Chief. McKeegan, why don't you come on up here or tell us what uh, the accomplishments uh, compliments of our officer, Mr. Ellis. Yep. Uh, Derek Ellis is our canine handler. Uh, every other year, uh, starting with Chief Phillip, uh, when I arrived, we do try to send our handlers to the canine national competition. Uh, we've had great success. The state of Minnesota is uh, one of the finest areas for producing canine handlers in the country. Uh, Derek's father, Jeff, won five national titles. Matt Holton, our lieutenant that retired earlier this year, won a national title and placed second twice. Uh, so we've got a lot uh, going for our program, and uh, Derek's really kept it going. Derek and his partner, Rudy, had a 10th place individual finish this year at the national competition. And the team of four he was on took first in the nation uh, down at that competition. Um, for us and for our handlers, that uh, the, the competition really mimics what we ask them to do, what we ask our dogs to do out in the field, especially when it comes to apprehension work, uh, both locating people and, uh, and the bite work that they do. So that type of training and the competitive environment really has a lot of carryover in what we're asking our dogs to do in the field. And that uh, has a lot of impact on um, when we do use them, that they do, that they do what we want them to do, they apprehend in the way that we want them to apprehend, um, and that, uh, like you said, really works out well for us. Uh, Derek's doing a fantastic job uh, carrying on a rich tradition here in Austin uh, with our canine handlers, and like I said, it was an outstanding result for him and his partner uh, at the, the Nationals this year. Where are the Nationals at? Uh, they were in Florida this year. Oh. Okay, is, you, is Rudy a Malinois? Yep, Malinois. He's, uh Almost five years old. That's the same kind of dog I took down to be terrorist, right? Yeah. Really, you ought yeah. to be proud of your bloodlines. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. All so. right. Okay, well, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Um, about the, just the national? You uh, have Rudy tell us, but. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, well, like uh, Chief McKeegan said, um, uh, Rudy and I went down to Florida for the national USPCA uh, canine patrol dog uh, competition. Um, did very well this year. Um, improved from the previous time we went down, uh, which is, is important, uh, and uh, represented Austin and uh, uh, Minnesota well. Um, yeah, I guess that's all I, I got, unless anybody's got some specific questions. Um, Does Moore County have a dog, or do we have the only one? Nope. In the Austin is the only one um, in Moore County. Uh, next closest would be Freeborn or okay. Olmstead. And he trained for dual training? Yep, he's trained for uh, patrol, okay. uh, apprehension, locating um, suspects, uh, people, evidence, and uh, also narcotics. And so you know, you've had it for how many years? Five years. You've had him all, and he is five years old. Yep, so yep. From a pup. Okay. Yep, and uh, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of these, um, you know, it's a competition, but it's also a certification. Uh, so Rudy's now nationally certified as a okay. United States police canine. Um, so uh, you know, that's that's part of the uh, the, cert the certification, um, and that all just kind of trickles down from you know the the, co the certification. Uh, he does well there. He also does well on the street. So you're lucky you have your dad to turn to too. Mm. He was <laughs> that helps. That definitely well, helps. I mean, that's great. I mean, it's perfect. Yep. So. so. Nice. All right, Dave. Well, thank you. Thank you, for Derek. I like I like the duty belt that contains a ball. Yeah, yeah that's the, that's the most important thing for him. He, <laughs> you see fun. him keep looking at me. It's because he wants that. So yeah. he'll like look around and he knows. So <laughs> I just want it for him to give him on the way out. So I'll give it to him now. But, right. but uh, well, thank, thank you guys. You, Congratulations. Thank you. Number four, we need a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Hold number five under public hearing to the resolution reviewing a tax abatement application from New Horizon Homes, LLC. Greg. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Members, uh, this is an application from New Horizon Homes. It'll be at 1309 18th Drive Northeast. The estimated value is $325,000. 
Um, interesting, if I, if I was reading the application right, uh, 1,204 square feet on the first floor and then 1,204 uh, might be unfinished on the lower level. So I think it just shows the cost of new construction. Um, you know, before you know it, you're up to that 325 from the estimated application. Otherwise, uh, the application is, is in conformance with our adopted policy. This is a public hearing. Council action is requested. Council, anything? It's a public hearing. Is there anybody here that came to speak on this is issue? If not, we need a resolution to approve or deny the abatement. So I'll move the resolution to approve. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Dankert. Councilmember King. Aye. Bashusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Kelly. <clears throat> Aye. Waller. Aye. Councilmember Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Number six. Still under public hearings is a resolution reviewing a tax maintenance application from Patrick James Connor. Same thing, Craig? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Members, uh, this one uh, as well doesn't have a specified number on the address, but it's on 10th place northeast. Uh, estimated value is 600 to 700,000 from the application. Obviously, that's a. Um, Pretty uh, significant home, uh, but from the application, looks like this is a relocation possibly to Austin. Um, probably important to note that they could build in a county outside of Mauer, so it's nice to have that kind of tax base addition in the community. It is in conformance with our adopted policy. Uh, council action is requested to approve the abatement, and this is a public hearing. Council, anything from the council? Public hearing, did anybody here come to speak on this tonight? If not, we need a resolution to approve or deny the abatement. I so move to approve. Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member King. Aye. Pushusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Haley. Aye. Waller. Aye. Council Member Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Seven is a motion setting a public hearing for December 2nd, 2019 for the wastewater treatment facility plan. We need a motion. So moved. Sir, second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Eight is a resolution setting a public hearing for December 16th, 2019 on the adoption of the five year capital improvement plan. We need a resolution. So moved the resolution. Sir, second. Second. Mr. Danker. Councilmember King. Aye. Pashusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Haley. Aye. Waller. Aye. Councilmember Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. Number 9 is a motion authorizing the use of DS 200 tabulating machines for all future city elections and setting a public open house for December 4, 2019 at 10 a.m. Ms. Cable. Yes, we um, received a grant to purchase new election machines in 2018. Uh, we purchased them, but uh, we weren't able to use them in the school district election because we didn't um, have enough time to certify them to the state. So we will be using them for um, all three elections next year, which would be the presidential primary in March, the regular primary in August, and then the November general election. So um, we have to um, provide information to the public about these um, per statute. So I'd like to set a public open house for Wednesday, December 4th at 10 o'clock where we'll invite the public, yep, here in City Hall um, in chambers where people can come in and get information and we'll have them fired up and show you how to use them. So Great. Council, anything? If not, we need a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Eight, er, 10 is a resolution <coughs> granting 2020 off sale liquor license, club on sale licenses, and wine on sale licenses. Ms. Kazel? Yes, these are all of the liquor license res um, holders that we're going to renew for 2020. These are not the on sales besides the clubs um, and the wines, but these would be the off sales and the breweries. So we have to get those up to the state earlier than the rest of our licenses. So we would request you approve them. Council, anything? If not, we need a resolution for 10. So move the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member King. Aye. Bashusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Haley. Epstein. Waller. Aye. Council Member Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 5 0 with one abstain, Your Honor. Thank you. 11 is a resolution approving the transfer of 102 South Main Street to the Port Authority. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members. Uh, <clears throat> similar to the Creekside Business Park, 
uh, we'd like to transfer this property to the Port Authority. This was part of the KSMQ project <coughs> and a remnant from that on to the east of the uh, project area. We'd like to transfer that to the Port Authority. It's been our arm for economic development. Otherwise, answer any questions. Otherwise, we need a resolution for approval. That's the lot between Domino's and the and grocery the store? Asian grocery, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Council, anything else? If not, we need a resolution. So I'll move the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member King. Aye. Bashusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Kelly. Aye. Waller. Aye. Council Member Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. 12, 12 is like a series of motions and an ordinance reviewing an ordinance to amend the future land use plan for mixed high density residential to commercial and rezoned property from an R2 multifamily residential to a B2 commercial for the property located at 1500 7th Avenue Northwest. Council, do you want to talk about this? Well, I know Mr. Lutz is here from the Planning Commission. Steve Keim has sent a kind of a compelling email to most of us, uh, kind of spelling out the reasons that he thinks we should uh, not do it. Uh, do you want to discuss this? Or Mr. Lutz, would you like to say a few words? I didn't say much about this last week, but after our two weeks, but after having two weeks to think about it, I guess I would be against rezoning this myself because it seems like we're just going along with, like Laura said last week, this is the way it's supposed to work. But go ahead and speak to it, Mr. Lutz. Okay, I'm Jay Lutz. I live at 1209 20th Street Northeast here in Austin. That puts me in the third ward. And I'm also a member of the City Planning Commission. And I want to be clear, I'm not here on behalf of the, in any capacity for the Planning Commission or any of the other members. I'm here just on my own. I think, I think there's two points I'd like to make about this thing. The first one is, is, is that thing we call the comprehensive plan that we spent a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of work by a lot of people over a number of years to put together. And that is meant for situations exactly like this to use as a guidance document to help us do orderly, organized, sound planning for development and zoning. If we're just going to disregard that, then it's really not worth the paper it's printed on. We put a lot of effort into that, and I think you should consider that strongly. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, I don't know what it is with zoning issues, but it, it just seems impossible to discuss them and keep everybody on track. It, it, in this particular case, it always turns into a discussion. At the Planning Commission it did, at your previous meeting it did, and it probably will tonight. It'll turn it into a discussion about a car lot, a used car lot because that's the intended use. The reality is the used car lot has zero bearing on this issue. It's wholly and totally irrelevant to it. You're not making a decision on whether or not to approve a used car lot. You can't even do that if you want to. You're going to discuss this and somebody's going to make a motion and then you're all going to vote. And that motion is going to be whether or not to approve or deny a request to rezone this property from R2 to B2, period. It's not a motion to rezone the property from R2 to B2 for a car lot. That has nothing to do with it. You can't even make that determination if you want to. You can't rezone it to use as a car lot. Even if this is a B2 business district, this owner cannot put a used car lot there until he first secures a conditional use permit. That permit does not come from the council. It comes from the Planning Commission. And unlike this zoning request that's a recommendation to council that can just be dismissed, that will be an approval by the commission. The same commission, I'll remind you, that not three weeks ago voted six to nothing unanimously to decline this rezoning request. So it's, it's not about a used car lot. What you're actually going to vote on is really whether to allow this property to be used for any, any of the listed uses under the B2 zoning district. There's over 14 different categories just for general use. There's another half a dozen for conditional uses. Those general uses aren't even specific uses, they're categories. So there, there's 
literally unimaginable different combinations or possibilities of what this property can be used for. What you're, what you're voting on is giving this property owner, whoever it is, a blank check to do any number of things with this property. Now, if this property was in different circumstances, if it sat out alone more, or was near other businesses, or was some way situated that any of these possible uses that you can cover wouldn't be a detrimental effect to the surrounding property, or more importantly, any citizens that live nearby, that'd be a totally different story. But that's not the case here. This property is right in the middle of a residential area. The only reason it ever was a car lot is because when the zoning ordinances were put together, it was grandfathered in. And ever since then, it's been a non-conforming use. Now, we have other areas in the city that are like that, and there's nothing we can do about them. Oakland Avenue West, First Avenue Southwest, they're a mess. And there's nothing we can do to go back and fix that. Because a lot of that was done before we even had formal zoning ordinances, certainly before we had a comprehensive plan. This property's different because that non-conforming use expired. So you have the opportunity, and now with the comprehensive plan, you have a tool that you can fix this. This area, this 14th Street Northwest Corridor doesn't have to end up like Oakland Avenue and First Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any Thank questions? You questions? Sure. Uh, were you on the Planning Commission back in the 70s when this area was zoned? No. Okay, so we don't know. I'm sure they struggled just as much then as now to zone it residential, considering it, that property has always been, a business has always sat on it. Right. They could have just as easily taken that piece of property back then and zoned it business or done something else, I'm now, sure. Legally, that's extremely difficult, as the city engineers explain. That's why all those properties city that attorney. when you zone city an area, if they're non-conforming, then they're brought in as non-conforming. Have I got that right? It's difficult to, to take away their rights to that property, otherwise just by rezoning it. No, I'm saying that. they could have made the whole block something else, or they could have zoned that property specifically, our uh, business at that time, instead of zoning the whole block, our residential. Right? Uh, I mean... Well, to answer the, the question I think you're asking, at any point between the 70s and today, the long-term uh, uh, land use plan that's in the comprehensive plan could have been adjusted to say that portions of 14th Street Northwest should be encouraged to develop as commercial. From the 70s to today, the zoning ordinance and the long-term use map and the comprehensive map have indicated that that area of 14th should be encouraged to develop as residential. The zoning ordinance and the long-term use plan uh, map and the comprehensive plan have gone through intensive reviews every five or ten years from the 70s to now without a change in that public policy. Uh, but, but that's not to say it, that it couldn't happen. It, well, it is true well, that a decision could be made looking out into the future that this area is appropriate for commercial and that a broader swath of 14th could be identified on that use, future land use map as future hopes for commercial. And then as properties ask for rezoning, they would be rezoned to fit that long-term plan. All of those are possibilities and all of those are within the control of planning commission and the and the council to effectuate okay they're not in place today for whatever right. that matters so uh, mr lutz if if this property does remain uh zoned as a residential do you ever see anybody would you develop that would you put a house on either one of these properties would, would I? you see anybody developing this property as residential since it hasn't happened in the last 40 years 50 years well, what I would do with it's irrelevant as well. You can't sit and read minds and imagine what's going to happen to this property. That's not the role. What's before you is whether or not to open it up to all these other uses. We will open this now, up. Now, would I want to live on that property and have an all-night fast food restaurant with a drive-up window 24 hours outside my bedroom window? No. I don't know if that answers your question, but... 
would you, well, I guess we've had fast food restaurants come and go in this town over the last 50 years, and nobody's approached the owner of that property to put one there, so I wouldn't think that would probably happen, and we've got somebody that's well, willing to buy how this. How in the world do you know that? <laughs> how do we know <laughs> Well, we've got somebody sitting here tonight that's willing to buy this property that I'm assuming is going to own the property for quite some time. And he says he wants to have a car lot there. And granted, it does open it up, but I've also been on this council long enough that we've operated or we've considered people getting conditional use permits and it stays with the property. And we say, oh, they're going to stay there forever. And within that time, they've already gone. And so that property still is stuck with that use where people can come in and do something in a residential area that it's not zoned for because the the variance that they got stays with the property, not the owner. So, I mean, nothing is forever. Things do change. And I think we have an opportunity to develop some land, have it useful and not sitting empty. And it's been, a business has sat on that property for as long as I can remember. And I've lived here for 58 years. So uh, it's, it's funny that your argument is, I think, essentially the same as Mr. Lutz's, which is, Things do change, and and no one is saying, do you approve a car lot for today? No, we knew that when we voted on this last at the last meeting. I did too. I approve a car lot for today. The problem is, I don't approve a fast food restaurant for five years or ten years or twenty no, years. No, what we're voting on is whether this goes from residential to business. We're not voting on what kind of business is going in there. It's whether we are going to rezone this from residential to business. Right. That's the we, issue before us today. if we choose it for business, it's a very wide definition and we will not yes. get another bite at that apple if something comes along that doesn't work for our community. And I all, personally think a rezone to a, a something more restrictive um, than B2, but well, then maybe we should than, maybe we should R2 cast the planning commission with coming up with additional zoning mm -hmm. classifications so that we can zone this exactly the way you want it zoned and change the <laughs> I read a memo plan. of like five options of zoning that we already have that we could use somewhere between these two. I think the pendulum swung way too far um, to go to all the way to the B2. I think if he's stick with residential you can have an empty lot and an empty building probably well, what you have is a difference in perspective whether or not you think it's appropriate as council members as elected officials to take the perspective of the of the property owner and look at it from his standpoint of what's best or whether you should take the perspective of these residents mm -hmm. the citizens that live in that neighborhood who have to deal with whatever goes in there and it affects their quality of life directly Whose perspective do you want to take? That's the decision you have to make. If we approve the rezoning tonight, what what is? Can you can somebody fill me in on on what go, happens from here? Um, I think you said it goes back to the planning commission, or is that was I incorrect? Once it's rezoned, it's rezoned. But the permit part of it. The property owner tomorrow can go get permits and start construction on anything allowed under B two. If, the, if he wants, he wants to go to forward with a car, car lot, he has to do what, Ms. Wallace? He's going to have to get a conditional yeah. use permit. Can we have Holly answer that for sure. us, please? Sure. Yeah, the particular rezone that he is asking for to allow a car dealership um, requires a 50-foot setback, so he's going to have to get a variance, which would be a decision by the planning council and then, uh, well, a recommendation from the planning council, final decision by council, and then he will also have to get a conditional use permit. Um, since the last meeting, um, I've also gotten a petition from um, Mr. Helmers, who has the property to the west, and he had indicated he would also um, rezone his property as Mr. Uh, Sorensen. So the exact same would apply to him as well. There would be a rezone, a variance, and a conditional use permit required. The conditional use permit is a final decision by Planning Commission unless it's appealed to the council within 15 days. I think we also have to take in the fact uh, that the Planning Commission voted 6-0 to do this, and I think they've thought about you know the same issues we're thinking about, and, and then we're going to ask them if we don't resort. <coughs> it's, it's a, I, I, I'm glad we had extra time. I think, think Mr. Lutz, I think you hit it on the head. I think it was a very thoughtful presentation you gave. I, I, I told Mr. Sorensen when he called me on the phone, I've uh, been here almost 12 years, I, I've never gone against 
a recommendation coming out of our planning commission. That's what you're tasked with. That's what you have done your due diligence around this particular issue. But others that came before us have never voted against. I don't think the council has in general. I can't think of a time where we've gone against our, our planning commission. This one is exactly right. It's not a car lot. It could be anything when you open it up. Also, I put a lot of stock in, as mentioned the last meeting, on that comp comprehensive plan that you mentioned. There's a lot of work from a lot of volunteer community members that go into that. And it's not lost on me that Mr. Byram has, has sent another document looking for options uh, that he wants to be sure council has some good clarity on what are our options. Th it's not lost on me because it tells me we're making the wrong decision. And this is, for the, this is for the greater good of the community, not just today, but down the road. Also, I mentioned at the last meeting, down, down on 14th Street, the intersection of 18th Avenue and 14th Street, sits a large parcel of land zoned industrial that we are going to have to deal with when that homeowner comes and says, yeah, it's industrial, but you know what? You did it for this parcel of property. You changed the, the land use. And that's a huge part of our future going forward out there in that, as an industrial site. So I would su significantly caution council to take a real hard look at what you've gotten for emails and what you've seen from our city attorney and what you've heard from Mr. Lutz and say this is not best for the city of Boston. Anybody else? Can we hear from Mr. Byron about those four options that were in the memo? Thank you, Mr. Lutz. Sure. So I sent the, uh, the memorandum as part of your backup material because I had the sense, rightly or wrongly, last meeting that there was an impression that absent rezoning to a B2 district, there were no other options for this property. And I'm not, the, the purpose and point of the memo was not to tell you that there are other superior options. It was really just to map out all of the various options that could be made uh, for the zoning classification of this property. Uh, it could be left in its R2 designation, which is really today the only options you have are yes to B2 or no to B2. So a no would leave it as an R2, but in the future, the landowner could bring back alternative requests for rezoning under, the, under these other categories, which would open up these other options. So the options that I laid out were what we call RO, which in our lexicon sort of means residential office. And it is specifically designed to allow office uses next door to and in and amongst residential properties. Uh, the types of businesses that it allows are lower scale or smaller scale businesses. Uh, it is a zoning classification that is deemed to work well uh, when you put residential next to more commercial uses. It does not allow a car dealership. It does allow some of the other business uses that have been uh, located on this property at other times, uh, like plumbing offices and, uh, and, and businesses like that. The uh, second option would be to rezone to B1 rather than B2. And the difference between that is B2 is a large scale commercial zoning classification. In its stated purpose, it talks about shopping malls uh, and more regional-wide attraction for customers and, uh, and commerce. So if you think about a, a, a B2, you're thinking about 18th Avenue. If you think about B1, which is designated as neighborhood business, you are looking for smaller scale businesses that tend to cater to the needs of the nearby residences. So the convenience store or the walk to bakery or the, you know, the smaller scale businesses that again are more conducive to a neighborhood setting. Um, B1 opens up a variety of different potential uses and, and I provided the ordinance as backup so that you could see that. Um, B2, which is what's under consideration, is again your more regional attractive commercial enterprises. And then as a last option, I highlighted a uh, not often used classification, but a classification that's in our ordinance and has been used in the past for what I would say is troubling pieces of property that are hard to develop because of maybe historic uses or, or, or other, other criteria. Uh, the last time I recall this used was when the Bur Bur Oak Manor Nursing Home was a non-conforming use that expired. And after it expired, uh, 
Uh, it couldn't be used as a nursing home anymore, and it sat vacant for a long time. And a developer came and said he wanted to put apartments in there. Uh, intensive residential didn't fit with the neighborhood, didn't fit with our long-term plan, didn't fit with a variety of different aspects of our planning. Uh, but we recognized there was a large existing structure that was going to make it very difficult to, to convert it to a conforming use. And we used the PUD, which stands for Planned Unit Development, which essentially creates its own zoning code for that one parcel because of something that makes that parcel unique and hard to develop. That is really the option in my mind that if everyone is set uh, for car dealership uh, being the most important thing to put on this particular parcel would be to use a PUD commercial, create a plan around that piece of land that restricts only to car dealerships without coming back and asking for an amendment uh, and locking in whatever the plan is that everyone feels is best for this parcel. It avoids the opening up the B2 designation to all of the listed uses, but it does state and specify that a car dealership is really all we're going to put on that property. So if we were to do that? We can't do that tonight, can we? No, we, no, we what you would do, do is you would, you would recommend to the landowner that they go back and present it as one of these alternatives if your inclination is to say no to a B2 designation. Who puts that plan together? You said we have to come up with a plan? Yeah, the PUD plan follows in many ways some of the same structures that like a plat map follows. So the, the developer presents an initial plan of how they are going to lay everything out. And then it goes through departmental reviews and comments about how that might impact neighbors, how it might impact traffic patterns, how it might impact other things. And a, and a plan is developed. It's a conditional use permit on steroids, sort of. It, it goes through a lot more review process than a does conditional it, use does permit. Does it stay with the property forever? And it stays with the, with the property, and, and in the future, uh, if someone wanted to use it for a purpose uh, use other than a car dealership, they would have to request an amendment then, and it would come back with the same sort of analysis of why would the PUD be converted to this other use at that time? Craig, with the PUD on a car lot, would you, would you overlook the 50-foot setback then because you could on a PUD? In yeah, in a, in, a, in a PUD, that like I said, you're kind of creating your own unique zoning rules for that piece of property. So Burr Oak Manor had some setbacks uh, for in, intense residential being next to single-family homes. And those were overlooked because as part of the PUD, just the setbacks were established to be what they were. Things like screening and fencing and lighting and other things were adjusted to minimize those impacts. But if <coughs> it goes through those processes and gets approval, then that locks that in as a permanent restriction so, on that property. So why was this property not considered for this yeah, rezoning could fit. instead of the B2? Uh, if I can't speak to the developer or the requester, but my th sense is, is that PUD is not often used, it's not widely known, and the B2 designation offers the attraction for any no landowner that it's a wider category of car dealership doesn't work, there are other options. From a landowner's car, perspective, Car dealership really better. doesn't work under B2 without special Variance. variances and... Runs into many of the same piece, things. So this nope. would be a better option, I would think. But. It, would, it would seem to me that what we need to do is vote this down tonight and then explore the PUD. I think it's a better fit for you guys, actually, or just as good a fit, and yet it, it protects us and, and everybody else from something else going in there. But it certainly wouldn't stop you from putting in it. You wouldn't need the variance. I think there's some advantages for you in this, actually. So I guess anybody else want to speak? Well, yeah, we typically have used PUDs for large parcels where we've had pretty large um, developments. So the original Fox Point project that failed was a PUD. And then the uh, only one that I've been involved in, in, besides the one that Mr. Byer mentioned, is the uh, proposed hotel near Torgi's. Um, that project has not moved forward. Um, the uh, the the investment into the property and that process is uh, quite substantial, um, and usually uh, we're talking about a, a ex, uh, 
a benefit to the community, you know, a large benefit to the community. Um, so my perspective, from my perspective, that's not the first thing that I would look at um, with regard to uh, rezoning a property. Um, most, proper, or most property owners would typically uh, be able to comply with whatever rezoning district that they are um, um, required to comply with. Um, this is unusual because the size of the lot is, not only is the, the use non-conforming, but the lot is also non-conforming um, in its size and inability to meet the standards required in our zoning ordinance. So um, that's, that's basically where I'm coming from with. So I think what we need to do is probably, I guess what I would do is not approve this tonight and then look into the PUD. Then the, then the, you know, it's going to be do we want to do the PUD or do we want to go back to just residential and leave it at, you know, there? Or I guess my question or another is, combination that Craig has. Or another combination. Up. Right. But I think we've heard enough arguments. Well, I don't think there's any other option that really allows a car, car dealership without him getting the variance and the CUP mm -hmm. without rezoning it unless we do the PUD. Right. right? Am That's I right. correct on that? That's correct. So. I guess if council could live with the PUD if it came back to us, um, I guess I could I could vote against this tonight. But if that doesn't happen, um, you know I guess we're we're losing out on an opportunity for this gentleman to to get into business. Um, but I guess I would like to see him be able to do what he wants to do there. And if people are worried about other things, then this restriction. I mean, with the PUD, you can obviously limit it to no fast food restaurants moving in there. Yeah, I actually think the PUD is the is the tool for this because there's obviously a sentiment in the community that it's been a car lot, we want it to stay a car lot, the lot's good for that, it's not good for a lot of other stuff. That's the sentiment that we have and then we, you know, and this is the tool that can get us there. Every other tool doesn't fit, doesn't fit as well. We'd have to be um, making some exceptions, variances and so forth. So. Great. Uh, Mr. Byron, we, we know the non-conforming use for the car dealership has expired. Has the use that it was a roofing contractor after the car dealership, has that expired? <clears throat> so uh, it was originally a plumbing business. There was a request to change the non-conforming use to a car dealership that was granted. Uh, there was no application to switch from a car dealership non-conforming use to a different car, to a different non-conforming use, and those switches don't happen automatically. So on a very technical and legal basis, uh, the fact that there was a, a uh, roofing business and other things that were in there between car dealership and when it expired uh, doesn't change the analysis of what options are available. Okay, thank you. Okay, Council, uh, what do you want to do? Uh, like you say, it, it seems like tonight the first step would be not to pass this if we're going to look at something else. Mr. Helmers, you got to come up here and give us your name and address. Yes, uh, my name is Bob Helmers, and my address is 1011 Oakland Place Southeast. And uh, and uh, this property that we're talking about tonight, do people remember what that property looked like 25 years ago? Mm -hmm. When I got that property, it had a DAP, uh, run-down two-stall garage. It had a building on the end with a mechanic shop in there. When I purchased it, there was actually a mechanic shop in the north end of the plumbing building. And that building was dilapidated, and so I tore that building down I rebuilt the other building up, and I think I really changed that area of town. I've had a lot of comments, and people said, my God, you fix that place up. May it look like something down there. So it was an, always a nice, clean operation. And as you know, I had been in front of the city a couple other times to zone that commercial and was denied the request to rezone it. And actually, uh, I went down to the zoning and planning on about September 15th and I talked to Holly and I said do you know of anybody coming in to try rezone that car lot right now and she looked it up she's no I don't know I haven't talked to anybody I don't know anything about it so I said you understand that the R2 is run out on it 
and they have to rezone it. So I said, if somebody comes in and makes an application, I want to be notified immediately so that I can make application at the same time because I own the land which is 45 feet by 150, the same as the north end on the car lot. And I said, I want to rezone that with them at the same time so I get the same zoning. And so she said, okay. Well, then about a week later, I called her phone at the, down there and I left a uh, voicemail stating the person's name that would be coming down, which was Mr. Curtis Sorensen. And then I never heard nothing. All of a sudden, I got a letter in the mail that, you know, this property's up for rezoning. So the very next day, I called Holly. I went down and talked to her, and I said, what happened here? How come I wasn't notified? And I said, I want to be on the same dock at the same day. And she said, oh, I'm really sorry. I, it happened so fast. He come in on September 30th, and they printed it on the paper on October 3rd. She said, we didn't have time to get you in. So she said, just go to the meeting, see what happens. So I went to the first meeting here, and when it was turned down six, six to nothing, the next day I went down to her office in the morning. I said, what do you think's next here? Because I was going to do an application for the rezoning of mine. She says, I think you should maybe not waste your money and wait and see what happens at the next meeting. So I did. And then at the next meeting, things changed. So then I went back down and did my application with her on it. And so that's because, like I say, in that strip, so if you took that north end, that'd only be 90 feet. That's not going to be life and death anybody. And on my part, all I'd want is a display area for three to six vehicles. That's it. And there's nothing across the road from it. It's all bare for maybe a thousand feet on the north side. You know, it's just the trees that you're looking at. But, uh, and not, and not only that, the city has to look at the fact that there's other R2 properties in this city that were on the city maps as R2 that within the last 10 years got changed from an R2 use to B2 commercial. And there's, uh, there's like three of them or four of them that I know of for fact that were changed. So it isn't like things get changed now and then because they do. You know, because, uh, for example, the one business on, on 4th Street Northwest was an R2 property, and they added probably a couple hundred feet north of it to it and made it all commercial. And it was under R2 zoning, just like mine on the map, because I have a copy of the map at that time. So anyway, but I think it'd make a nice car lot, and I think Mr. Sorensen do a good job there. And um, so that's it. Thank you. We, okay. I, I, yeah, I, have a, I have a question from yes. Mr. Sorensen, not for you. Bob. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I guess, Mr. Sorensen, I guess my question for you is would you be willing to, if we voted down the rezoning to B2 tonight, to pursue the PUD? Most definitely. Okay. Um, Curtis Swanson, 303 27th Drive Northwest. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, not what I expected going into this, but it's, um, it's very interesting. And I, I thank you all. I, it sounds like we've had emails. We've had a lot of talk. We've had a lot of thought and discussion over this property, as I have myself and a lot of work. And I'm really glad tonight to hear that we have some solutions. Um, you know, that, that's basically what I'm looking for. I brought my form to Holly, and I'm, I'm just looking to get my car lot form signed so we can get this going. If the PUD is an option, that is great for me. Um, I know it has, always has been a business. Everyone in the community there, when they purchased their homes, when they moved there, it probably was a business. So it, it's nothing new to them. And I completely understand and I respect the comprehensive plan that, that we put money into, not, not just you know, your time uh, you know, in the community, our money into, to doing this comprehensive plan and, and following it. I think this still is a unique property. Um, as Craig said, normally the B2 is for a large scale commercial operation. This is not a large scale lot. Holly didn't bring up the PUD to me exactly why she said, because it's, it's costly and time consuming, I think she said. So it didn't occur to her. This is the first I've heard of the PUD option. Am I saying that right? Is it PUD? I'm totally open to that. If we're willing to put more money and more time into doing this, 
I'm all for it. And I think what you've seen from council is there's nobody on the council no. doesn't, that says we don't want a car lot there. No. But no. they're saying we don't want to get into a territory where two or three years from now this might turn into something that we hadn't wanted there, but because we rezoned it as such, Correct. we can't do anything about it. And I agree, and I go back to the unique size we talked about. I heard a, a gas station, a food, a fast food joint, things like that. I don't think this lot is the correct size for something like that. Probably not. Um, so I think it is a, you know, it's a unique situation. Um, we mentioned a lot, um, 18th and 14th, that's, you know, 100 by 200 lot. That, that's a huge lot. That could be zoned to B2 and, and be put anything there. Given the size of this lot, I don't see much that it could be besides a car lot. And again, I'm here for solutions to, to getting that done. You know, if the PUD is the route that we all want to go, I will most definitely pursue that. And Glenn already said, I think we're both all for that. We're here for solutions. My um, question to Mr. Byram is, if we do a PUD on this, what happens to Mr. Helmer's property? Does he have to come in separately and ask for it? Or how does that work? Uh, yeah, anything that Mr. Helmers wants to do would have to be submitted by a separate application to be considered separately, and and uh, the only thing uh, that may influence uh, the result is you know whatever happens here changes the neighborhood to some degree and does become relevant in considering whether Mr. Helmers' property that doesn't touch on 14th is. Okay. So you know, situated that? such that it would make sense for anything he's asking for. We'd use the same thing, the PUD on that? Well, what I, so I'll read a couple of things. Uh, PUD, the purpose uh, is intended to uh, encourage developers to use more creative and imaginative approaches in the development or renewal of existing properties. Uh, it is intended to be used in areas of the city that need rehabilitation and development, uh, in areas where it is believed that private investment should be encouraged. Uh, or recognition that redevelopment cannot be expected under our normal rules. Mm -hmm. So if you use a P PUD uh, under either of those two categories, you should be looking at a property that has been previously developed in a way that makes it very difficult to redevelop under normal rules. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that that applies broadly to vacant lots or to other pieces of property separately, but one of the things that has been mentioned by this uh, applicant is that there's an existing structure, there's existing paving, it's sort of set up as a car dealership and because of that it may make it difficult to redevelop in other ways. Mm -hmm. So it fits within some of those criteria that are in our ordinance for use of PUD. But the PUD gives us a chance to pigeonhole it into one use. Exactly. Use. Okay. Council, let's, we should get moving. Thank you. Thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Let's have a, uh, well, we're, we're reviewing the ordinance to amend a future land use to an R2. We need to either approve or deny that. I guess I'd make the motion to deny the, uh, the agenda item and send it back to the Planning Commission to research uh, PUD. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I don't think we need to go further then. Um, Mr. Lutz, I want to thank you for coming in. I mean, I, I think some people have changed their mind. You've given us some more information that uh, I think we're going to, I think everybody will be happier when, when this process is done. So thanks for coming in. And thank you guys for coming in. All right, thanks. All right, 13 is a motion appointing Sue Grove to the library board term from December 1, 2019 to December 31st, 2022. We need a motion. So moved. Second. Is there all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Number 14 is a resolution accepting donations to the city. We need a resolution. So moved. Second. Mr. Dankert. Council Member King. Aye. Bashusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Bass, uh, Helly. Aye. Waller. Aye. Council Member Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. 15 is a resolution approving contracts with SEH. For engineering services for Austin National Guard Armory easements, Mr. Lang. I wish I could explain this easier, <laughs> but uh, the city for the airport navigation, we need an easement from the armory. And the armory is landlocked in their current location, so they need an easement from the city for access across our property to Highway 218 and they also need an easement from us for drainage because their site runs off onto our property. Uh, this all kind of came up about five years ago when the armory looked to uh, rehab or refurbish their building. That kind of started the process and we've been working on it ever since. So it's a, it's a long and cumbersome process when dealing with um, the FAA 
and then also you incorporate the city government and the state government with the armory so working through that process um, we we actually have to uh, develop um, values for each of the easements uh, we need to buy the easement rights from the armory then and, and those costs are eligible for reimbursement through the FAA then we have to develop a cost for the easement the access and drainage easement that the armory wants and then we need to have them purchase that easement from the city uh, another layer that's involved with it is um, we are actually granting them access or granting them an easement to airport property which was likely purchased with FAA dollars back when it was Decker Acres and, they, and you can't sell FAA property so there's just another layer that we need to research so um, in explaining this uh, portion of these costs will be 90% uh, FAA eligible the remaining 10% is split up 5% uh, state and 5% local so the the costs associated with the city acquiring the easement over the armory property only has a 5% impact to the city for the total cost but the easement that the city would grant to the armory for access and for drainage uh, that is not eligible for FAA we would look to the armory to split uh, those costs and the way it would work out is a lot of those costs on the armory standpoint would be paid for I'm making it too confusing they'd be paid for by the grant dollars that we pay them for our easement so a lot of work is involved and that's why this is a, a, a higher engineering cost than a normal project that we bring forward to you so uh, we've received a proposal from SEH two separate proposals one for the easement that we would get for the armory and one uh, for the easement that the armory would get for us from us those two costs are broken out at um, an estimated cost of uh, let me find it here a second um, estimated cost of forty two thousand five hundred dollars for the easement that we would get from the armory and an estimated engineering cost of sixteen thousand dollars for the easement that we would uh, give to the armory those costs do not include any of the acquisition these are just the engineering at this time to put together all of the documents put together the appraisals and get everything ready we would then bring back to you in the future what those actual easement costs would be so to develop everything put everything together we'd recommend approving these two separate agreements with SEH to begin working and bringing this project forward any questions? <laughs> well, you explained it perfectly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dumb it down a little bit, Stephen. Why do you have runway 17? What happened to 1 through 16? Uh, it, it actually has to do with 17 is 170 degrees. So if you would look on a azimuth for a 360 degree circle, our runway is, associate, is uh, set up at uh, 170 degrees and uh, is it 1734 yeah so uh, 340 degrees and 170 degrees it's not quite straight north-south it's a little bit skewed so you name it based on how it's situated on the, the angle yep I'll be damned yep. <laughs> these are cost us the 42 5 and the 16 the correct the 42 5 is covered 90% federal 5% oh, okay. state 5% local okay. the 16 5 is covered 100% by us and the armory. You split that. Correct. Okay. Okay. Good. Questions? If there's no questions, we need a resolution. So move the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Dankert. Councilmember King. Aye. Pashusta. Aye. Fisher. Aye. Halley. Aye. Waller. Aye. Councilmember Large Austin. Aye. Resolution passes 6 0, Your Honor. Thank you. 16 is a motion granting the Planning and Zoning Department the power to contract for the removal of junk and or illegally stored vehicles at 606 13th Street Northeast, the Yana Bidith property. I uh, need a motion. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There, there's no citizens here tonight. So. If either one of you reporters want to say something to the council, we'll listen to you. No? All right, let's move on then. 
All right, why don't we, why don't we talk to you now instead of after the work session? How are things going? Very good. Very Have you been able to use any of your knowledge yet <laughs> that you um, gained from us? <laughs> not, not yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure that I will use them in the future. Okay. Yeah. I'd rather touch base with you after a council meeting when, you know, people are, uh, can see you on TV and stuff than after the work session when it's just us. So if we could, we'll do that every week if that's okay. Every other week if that's okay. Yeah. All right, reports and recommendations. Paul, we'll start with you tonight. Nothing, Your Honor. Laura. Nothing, Your Honor. Jeff. I have nothing, Your Honor. Rebecca. Nothing, Your Honor. Steve. I had the occasion last oh, week to talk to. So I good. never say anything. Excuse, excuse me. <laughs> Can the record reflect? I've never, ever, hardly a said anything at this time, and I get, <laughs> and I get this. Yeah, Just I, for I'll some. I'll my time to uh, call yeah. the person King. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll take Laura's time. Uh, I had the opportunity to uh, speak to the fourth grade class at Sumner, fourth grade classes. There's 90 kids, three classes last Thursday, and it was the absolute best day of my week, maybe even the last day of my month. Government, city government. Uh, so just a shout out to my new friends in the fourth grade <laughs> class at Sumner Elementary School. I had a ball. Not, I've talked to some school, nothing is more enjoyable than talking to That's those kids. Nice. Joyce. I have nothing. Thank okay, you. Greg. Uh, we had the CGMC uh, fall meeting where we adopted policy positions for the coalition, so that was interesting. We had some pretty in-depth discussion on dues and how that should look going forward and the assessments as far as that's concerned. Rochester dropped out of the, it will be dropping out of the coalition, so that was a big financial hole that we had to adjust, so that's kind of interesting for the region, but that's all I have. Um, Julie and Tom have a couple items as well. Julie. Yes, I just want to make sure that everybody comes by and checks out the new external book drop at the library. It was um, took us some time to get it going, but it's entirely for the patrons' ease of use. You can drive in, roll down your window, drop the books in the box, roll up your window, and drive away. Um, so we're really hoping it um, the people like it, and um, we want to thank the Ladies Floral Club and the Friends of the Library for donating all the money to get that put together. So that was really amazing. Um, the only other thing I want to mention is that on Tuesday, December 10th, we'll be doing episode two of Race, the Power of an Illusion, um, the uh, documentary screening and discussion. We had the first one last week and had a really good discussion, and we look forward to people coming. We also have the documentary that you can check out from the library if you want to catch up for um, that meeting on December 10th. Thanks. Thank you, Julie. Tom? I uh, just want to let council know that this week we will be uploading the 2020 Truth and Taxation documents. So it will be uploaded to Dropbox. It will be out on our website hopefully tomorrow um, for the December 4th, 6 o'clock meeting that we'll have here um, for the truth. Again, Truth and Taxation is required by state statute. The other item I just wanted to announce we'll have on the next council agenda the approval of the Hormel Foundation grants that were awarded for the city of Austin for next year. We had the Riverside Arena roofing approved, delivering the data hotspots, two drones for the emergency situations for police, Todd Park replacement of nine scoreboards, the J.C. Hormel Nature Center education programs, the curling program at Pack Arena, and fire prevention education, which those added up were about 343,000 of approvals. We had another 90,000 in pass-through grants for Leadership Austin, 4th of July, which won't be passed through anymore and the Artwork Center rent and property taxes. And then finally, we got another 410,000 for the two bridge enhancements along I-90 and $60,000 for an I-90 Welcome to Austin sign. So in total, just under $850,000 in contributions this year from the foundation and they are greatly appreciated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Stephen, I just want to congratulate you guys for that road on East Oakland and getting it open. It looks great. People are very happy with it. I had to kind of walk around and inspect everything the other day, but uh, hopefully we won't get that under center, that area closed. That's twice now in what, two or three years. So good, it looks great over there. Greg, do we have anything else? Nope, I think that's it. The only thing I have to add is we went to the coalition meeting. I think me, Craig and myself are both represented on the board. It would be nice to have council members come up to some of these uh, coalition meetings. We definitely, they know who Austin is up there, and we definitely get a say in what goes on with the coalition. So uh, we're, we're enthusiastic <coughs> members. Other than, other than that, we need a motion to adjourn to December 2nd, 2019 at 530 in council chambers. So, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll take a short break and meet now.
Nie mogę. 